Hello everyone, this is Sage and welcome to the Executive Corner, the 20 minute roundup. And today we're very lucky to have Mr. Matt Barry, the CEO of Freelancer.com. And we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how one can create multiple passive income streams. So to give you some background, Freelancer.com is the world's largest freelancing and crowdsourcing marketplace and was listed as one of the top 30 best funded Australian fintechs of 2020. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Matt. Nice to meet you. Perfect, thank you. With Matt's chart topping credentials, as well as experiencing cryptography and digital online payment systems, we're keen to share his insights with you today. So Matt, without any further delays, let's get started. Freelancer being the third largest IPO to date on the ASX is a game changer for entrepreneurs, small businesses and large organisations, which provides easy access to talented freelancers from around the world who offer a wide range of services at competitive prices. Having said that, could you please shed some light on the different services offered by these freelancers? Sure. Well, we have the largest network of online talent globally. We've got over 50 million people in our marketplace and it's growing by about 25 to 40,000 new users a day. Uh, any job you can possibly think of, you can get someone to do for you through the internet. There's over 2,000 skills. It's something as simple as web design, graphic design, copywriting, data entry, right through to you know, manufacturing, product design, um, you know, go uh, you know, paint my wall, uh, you know, help me with interior design. Any job you can possibly think of, no matter how big or small it is, uh, you can get done in our marketplace. And we cater from everyone right down to consumers, you know, it's something done as simple as $10, right up to large organizations and enterprise, such as Deloitte, Airbus, Nova Nordisk, uh, NASA, and so on. Well, you've just mentioned some really big names there and freelancers one of them as well freelancer.com brands itself as a partner in the new world of work which is solving a trillion dollar problem what sort of problem is the company referring to here well five billion people on the planet live on 30 dollars a day us or, or less than that so five billion people need a better job and so we provide opportunity income and technical jobs uh, to people all around the world uh, who want to basically either uh, change their career, supplement their income or try something new. Um, and so it's an incredible resource for providing um, uh, you know, well-being to the world. At the same time, is it, we provide uh, the ability for anyone uh, in, in Western economies to basically turn their dreams into reality. Uh, we, we help uh, you know, take that idea you've got and, uh, and make it real uh, through uh, freelancers helping you kind of build build your product or your service and deliver it to market. So we, we've, we've helped a whole bunch of really creative things uh, uh, come to fruition. Fantastic. And they say good managers solve problems, but great leaders create momentum. And there's definitely an obvious trend of momentum occurring that freelancers are able to connect 40 million professionals worldwide. That's amazing. Um, so although the gig economy has opened up a whole new world of opportunity for freelancers, it presents some serious challenges in terms of cybersecurity for gig workers. How does freelancer.com come into play here? Um, well, so we actually uh, help you work online in a, in, a, in a fairly secure fashion because we have the concept uh, where the whole platform provides security. We have a concept of, of milestone payments. So um, you know, to, to ensure that uh, the work gets paid for and every hour worked is a uh, is, is our, our paid for. Um, uh, when you go post your job, you suffer a series of payments that the freelancer requests, um, and it, it's they're mapped to deliverables. And as um, work is done, um, uh, the money is paid. Uh, or alternately, if you're doing an hourly job, you submit your timesheet, and we have a system that automatically pays. Um, if uh, something does go wrong and you have a dispute, we have uh, an arbitration and dispute resolution service. Uh, so the two of you uh, can basically uh, uh, sort it out with the help of our paralegal team. So. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal um, uh, business. We've done, uh, as, actually in the next 24 hours, we've hit 20 million projects globally, uh, all time. Uh, we're, I think, about 5,000 projects away. As of this morning, we do about 10,000 projects a day. So sometime tonight, we'll, we'll hit that milestone. And of that, a very, very, very tiny number go into, go into dispute uh, because we've got a, a great system for basically people working, working it out and, um, and, a, and a great payment system. Absolutely. Sounds like a fantastic support infrastructure there. And 
the way to stay young at heart is to keep the dream alive. So sounds like a winning combination. And as per the company, no crowdsourcing platform globally has a liquidity of freelancer.com. Could you please elaborate on the same? And correct me if I'm wrong, but the IPO generated a huge 15,700% return for investors. Would that be correct? Uh, yeah, so in terms of liquidity, um, so 68% uh, of jobs get bid on within, uh, within 60 seconds. So no matter how complex your, your project is, um, you can put it up and there's people within the um, community of actually 50 million uh, freelancers globally that can bid in a job. Um, so it's pretty amazing. If you've got a job that you've been trying to get done for a while, you've been putting it off, you thought, how can I get going on this, et cetera. Uh, we've been trying to find someone that's been really hard going through traditional you know, networks of friends and family or whoever, whoever it is. Uh, you know, putting a, a project up there and getting people bidding on instantly is, is pretty amazing. It's free to do that. So I encourage if someone's got something they've been, they've been, they want to do, no matter how easy or complex it might be, um, uh, post a project and, and you'll get feedback right away. So that's 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 on the liquidity side. So then there's nowhere in the world that is liquid as, as we are. Um, that's one way of doing work, which is putting a project up. The other way of doing work is getting a contest run. So a contest is where uh, maybe you've got something visual and you want to get a logo done for your business and, and you want to pick the best design. So you can put up a prize and then people compete for the prize. And on average, 220 entries come in per contest and contests can start as simple as $10 and work its way up to, we've got NASA posting contests for many hundreds of thousands of dollars for very complex uh, designs. And typically with a contest, you get about 40 times leverage on your, on your bank for bucks. So, Every dollar you spend, you get a, about a 40 times uh, uh, leverage in terms of the amount of work that gets done, because obviously a lot of people are competing and it's a very iterative, you can say, I like this, I don't like this, et cetera, and, and, and converge to a, a great solution. And, that, and you can do you can do a contest across any of the categories of work. In regards to your other question, which was uh, the, the the IPO, et cetera, I mean, in this particular um, business, I, um, I bootstrapped it pretty much the entire way. So I raised a very small amount of money at the very beginning in 2009. And then rather than go down the, the route of raising money from venture capitalists and doing series A, B, C, D, J, K, M, Q, uh, instead, I decided to uh, try and grow the business as, as an operator uh, where, uh, you know, I didn't have to raise money. And instead, I, I, I financed the business through the best means possible, which is basically selling something useful to customers. So um, I raised a very small amount of money, 2.5 million US dollars. I bought a very small website uh, out of Sweden. Um, and I ran that from 2000 nine to 2013 when we IPO'd um, and um, uh, when it opened it was the third uh, highest uh, game uh, in the history of the ASX. Um, uh, the issue price was 50 cents and it opened at um, $2.50 went to $2.60 uh, and in, in the process of, of taking the business uh, from the very very early stage where I kind of raised one round of financing that was it and never raised a single cent of operating capital through to the IPO, um, yeah, the, the gain was about, it was over 15,000% gain. Uh, it, was, it was quite, it's quite, it's quite uh, good actually, I guess, or uh, there's a few um, uh, early uh, uh, employees of the business who put, you know, $5,000 in and kind of uh, got uh, close to a million dollars out. So uh, that was, that was quite, uh, quite interesting and satisfying to watch. Very inspiring story. Thank you for sharing that. And recently, Freelancer hit a new milestone by acquiring Australia's largest heavy haulage freight company, Loadshift. Right. And um, this is an, another milestone uh, aside from the one you're, you've discussed today. And we would like to hear what was the rationale or objective behind the acquisition of this marketplace, please. Well, to step back of kind of what you know what we're doing as a strategy, I mean, some of the largest companies in the world by market capitalization are global marketplaces of products. And so there's your Amazons, your Alibaba's, your Ebay's and so forth. Um, and this is going to happen in services as well. In fact, the services market is actually larger than the, than the products market. Uh, it's just been delayed because it took some time for, for emerging market talent to come on the internet. Uh, and also delivery of services is a lot more complex. You know, if you're trying to buy a, a, and design a website of the internet, it's a lot more complex than buying a book. Right, and so um, you know the market is it's huge, but it's it's also um, you know it's a little bit um, uh, lagging behind the products marketplace. But certainly, you know, we we are trying to build the next Amazon, and um, our businesses are in the broad fields of labor, payments, and freight. Uh, so you know, building something, paying for it, and moving it. Um, so in freelancer, it's a global marketplace of jobs, the largest in the world by number of users by far. We're a top 500 website globally. I think we're we broke into the top 450 today, uh, in Alexa. So a huge amount of traffic, so it's where you can get people to build things for you. We have escrow.com, which is a global payments business. And escrow is important because in some parts of the world, 
um, the regulation requires you to use a regulated um, escrow service in order to make the payment, and that adds to the security, uh, making sure the freelancers get paid, and making sure that people posting jobs get uh, get the, what they want. What they want, and so that's why we have escrow.com, and we've made escrow.com available for other businesses around the world. And we've uh, last year we closed eBay Motors, so we we do um, the payments for cars in the US, and eBay Watches, so we do the payments for watches, and we're in all sorts of segments such as um, you know, aeroplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art. Uh, we're in Artsy, for example, we're in Shopify uh, and so forth. And then we have um, the, the freight business. As so the freight business came along, and really that's just one of the 2000 categories of work that we do on, for, for, on Freelancer. And we've built custom versions of our marketplace just to specialize on different um, uh, verticals with partners before. Uh, but this is the first time we've, we've, we've done this uh, in terms of actual um, uh, subsidiary. So we own 53% of Freightlancer, which is um, basically a version of Freelancer just for, for moving freight around. And of course, you know, many of the things that we sell uh, on escrow.com, whether it's cars for eBay and so forth, they need to be moved, right? Uh, and likewise, anything that uh, is moved uh, needs to be paid for. Uh, and uh, you know, drivers need to be, um, you, know, you know, when you're moving large heavy haulage, so you're moving cranes, or you're moving things from mining sites or construction sites and what have you, um, it can be uh, these moves can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and so uh, that's where escrow comes in. So they all do. It is method in the madness, and it all does fit together quite quite nicely. But we did just buy um, Australia's largest heavy haulage uh, uh, freight marketplace called uh, Loadshift. Uh, combined, our freight uh, division uh, last year, um, pro forma, did 88 million kilometres of freight. So that's a lot of freight. Um, uh, and uh, we've just, you know, we've, we've only had that for a few weeks now, and we're in the business of uh, building it up. And now we've got a, brought in a new chief executive, Tom Cavanaugh, who's an experienced mining uh, services executive who um, just um, merged his business and floated uh, his old business um, uh, with Mars Group, which is now I think a 1.5 billion market cap on the ASX. And so he's he's left there to do it all again, and he's coming as CEO as a freelancer. So we're pretty excited about this. Uh, so that, you know, that um, 88 million kilometers of freight represents 70,000 uh, freight movements in the last 12 months. Wow, that's an impressive tally. And it sounds like a really exciting time to speak to you with all these new developments going on and, and milestones being reached on this particular day. So really great that we've been able to slot in an appointment with you. Um, and back onto the discussion here, Australia's unemployment rate fell to its lowest level in a year in april 2021 despite a decline in employment do you think the recent revival in the jobless rate will push the central bank to tighten its monetary policies at all well i, d I don't think we've actually seen we i i think the numbers right now we haven't seen the true impact of kind of um covid and, and where they are i mean job keeping just came off in march march 31st this year so only about eight weeks ago so i think the, and, and i think the the employment numbers included covid because we're providing all this um, support for um, job owners, uh, job um, sorry, business owners, um, and so forth. So I think uh, we've got to really watch the next month or two and see really what happens. Obviously, there's been a whole bunch of industries that have been uh, fairly badly impacted, such as um, you know your, your tourism and and uh, you know, retail and, and hospitality and so forth. But on the, on the flip side, Australia's economy has done extremely well on the on the commodity side. So. Um, Iron ore is up 250% um, in the last 12 months, or well, it's come down in the last last, last week or so. Mm. Uh, coals at a two year high, et cetera. So even though the trade war with China going, we've done really well on the exports. So so some parts of the economy are going, it's probably that two speed economy, so it's, only, it's probably three speed now. You know, some parts of the economy are going really well and some of the parts of the economy are, are, are almost zeroed in some respects and, and some are kind of staggering along. So I don't think we'll have a true indication of kind of where the numbers are. Um, uh, for a few more months. But one thing I will say is job vacancies in the last ABS figures were up 29% year on year. So while the number of people employed was actually pretty flat, um, the number of vacancies is up 29%. So there's a lot of businesses now that are looking to find talent that can't. And that's where Freelancer comes in. You can find talent online. You can find so fairly in, uh, inexpensively. And that's, you know, one thing we're trying to do is we're trying to help any business around the world uh, find that intellectual capital uh, to basically grow their business and take it to the next stage. Absolutely, and businesses need all the help they can get at these tough times. And I think Victoria's gone into a lockdown again for a week and who knows what sort of support packages they'll receive from the federal government, although the state's coming through with some sort of circuit breaker support. Um, we're definitely seeing a redistribution of power uh, with the different sectors emerging during this uh, last downturn. So yes, I, I think um, the services freelancer provides will definitely be 
of benefit to many businesses. Um, in Australia, most gig economy workers are classified as independent contractors, not as employees um, are usually, not entitled to benefits such as minimum wage or superannuation and workers' compensation. Do you expect this trend to change in coming years or do you see incentives and opportunities for freelancers in Australia? Well, uh, there's, well, there's a few things. Uh, first of all, that's not strictly true. Uh, in Australia, we have the concept of casual wages and casual wages are 25% higher um, than, than normal wages because they're supposed to account for those benefits, which, which um, uh, you don't have it as, a, as a casual employee. So, you know, that, that's why casual wages are higher. So, you know, we already really do have the protective mechanisms um, to uh, in place where, um, you know, that people should be paid, be paid uh, you know, a higher amount um, or higher rate. Now, obviously, the higher, the more people get paid, the better for us. We take a commission of, of, of what you get paid. So, um, you know, we're all for people being paid more. Uh, and, and we think education is the lubricant of upwards mobility. So the more people get educated, the more people can upskill and get experience, the better. Um, but uh, in Australia, uh, you know, we, we, we do have pretty good uh, mechanisms. We also have the highest casual wages in the world. Uh, one of the reasons why restaurants don't open up past 9 30 10 o'clock at night is because you know the wages go up so so dramatically um you know uh I, I i personally think that you know people should be able to say what they want to get paid right and if you know you only paid a certain amount you're happy with that you can be paid that at the moment i can work for free or i can work for uh anything above the minimum wage but i can't work for anything in between so i'm not a very good graphic designer if i wanted to kind of just get my start in the industry and wanted you know personally to try that out i should be able to say what i want to get paid and not either be forced to donate my time and work for free unpaid or to, to be paid a, a certain amount, I should be able to dictate. But you know, it is what it is and, and we do have very high wages here. And in fact, the high wages and the high rents are one of the things that actually is uh, the twin pincers that are actually really hurting uh, uh, business in Australia in a big way. Um, uh, you know, uh, the land costs are extremely expensive. I mean, the Sydney and Melbourne restaurants were paying more on a per square, square metre basis than Manhattan was pre-COVID. And uh, we've got the highest casual wages in the world, so uh, you know it's it's pretty tough doing business in this country. But the flip side is, if you if you do do business and you come out the other side and you're successful, you actually are a great operator, and you can you can take that business global and do very well. And we're seeing that with the likes of many great Australian companies that are taking the world stage, such as Atlassian and Canva and so forth, who you know uh, you know kind of built their business up by being great operators and taking it global. Amazing! Yeah, it's great to see Australian businesses being the major global players. And recently released federal budget primarily focused on job creation to bolster the economic growth after the COVID-19 downturn. At a time when the nation is already facing high job vacancies when the pre-pandemic phase, or well, higher job vacancies than we saw in the pre-pandemic phase, do you think the recently announced measures in the budget will increase the level of job vacancies further? Well, it's interesting, actually, that the budget actually compared to previous budgets was actually, I could see some intelligence behind how it was put together. Um, in the past, you know, I mean, clearly it was an election budget, you can do it, but it wasn't as 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 as, uh, as egregious as it was previously with it, where they might put in a car park next to a train station, a certain marginal electorate. Um, in this particular case, though, you know, there was money for apprentices and this and the other. But um, I think one of the things that we've missed in the whole pandemic response in Australia is a real once in a lifetime opportunity to upskill and uptrain in a big way. And I, and I mean this in terms of a in Manhattan project or an Apollo uh, project sort of level, um, you know, rather than paying um, people to uh, sit in their bums in many cases in zombie businesses, trying to make a job uh, that in a, in a business that, that couldn't, couldn't really function efficiently, um, I think it would be it would have been better to put a lot more money into uh, education and training uh, at, a, at a much bigger level. And, uh, I would have paid people to go to university in the right areas that could get the economy back on track. And, you know, not not all, uh, you know, this is quite controversial, but not all um, fields of study do have the same impact on the economy. While they may um, all contribute quite greatly to the, you know, the advancement of human knowledge and thought and and and, and, and research and so forth, um, you know, I would have focused on on jobs that do lead to um, business creation, do, need, do lead to, um, um, you're moving higher up the value chain in terms of elaborately transforming the, the, the um, raw materials we dig out of the ground in this country and turn them to higher end, higher value manufactured goods before we export them across the world. Um, and also in the trades, I would have paid people. Uh, I think we should build a, 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 a take really TAFE and, and, and trade schools to the next level and build a um, you know really world class 
uh, trade schools so we can bring you know, you know, advanced manufacturing uh, to back to Australia's shores. Manufacturing has dropped quite uh, dramatically as a, as a percentage of gross uh, value add over, over the last number of decades. So I think it's about 6% at this point. Um, you know, manufacturing in Australia is on par with a financial haven like like uh, Luxembourg, <laughs> you know, or Liechtenstein. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, it's almost non-existent. Um, but I think, you know, you know, if we're going to maintain the way of life we have in this country um, and um, demand, continue to, continue to demand um, high wages and, um, you know, have high casual wages and, you know, you know good, good jobs and so forth, we've got to move up the value chain. And to do that, we've got a, you know, we've got a great abundance of natural wealth in this country with all our resources, but we, we just dig it out of the ground, ship it overseas. We, we need to dig it out of the ground elaborately transform it into something that's higher, higher margin, higher value, uh, uh, and which can demand higher paid jobs and, uh, and, and demand and needs higher skills. And uh, they're, the, they're jobs in, in, in um, you know, in, in, in manufacturing, in, in uh, engineering uh, at all levels, not just white collar engineering, blue collar engineering, et cetera. The trades are very, very, very important. Uh, and there's a lot more, a lot more we can do there. Uh, at the moment, we've got a very primitive economy. I think we rank I think 87th was it on the Harvard Economic Complexity Index, which is a rank of how uh, complex or um, difficult our products or services are for other companies to um, to copy or replicate. And you know we're behind you know Mauritius, Oman, you know you know Sudan, Saudi Arabia, and so forth, and we're dropping like a rock. And certainly with COVID, um, uh, that's got worse because that was measured when travel was 18%, you know um, tourism was 18, 17% of the um of, of the measure so that's gone to zero pretty much or close well you see what domestic tourism but it's 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 dropped a lot so that we, we would have um uh decreased even further on the harvard economic complexity index so there's a lot we need to do um but uh i think instead of paying people to sit in their bums in zombie companies which you know are ultimately going to unwind um now that the stimulus has come off we should have paid people to go get educated and skill up because it's one of the fastest ways to increase the gdp of the country right because you know people do a, you know if they're if they train in the right areas and the right for, for the right jobs um that you know three years later four years later two years later however long the program is um you, you can demand a higher wage and or, or create a business that um that generates a higher higher productivity and 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 uh, more revenues for the country so you know i think that's where i'll be focusing more Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your insights and hopefully they go out into the ether and, and cause a bit of momentum because um, you're absolutely right. Um, in Australia, we've seen the GDP increase with more focus on women and also um, the focus on the labourers and there's a construction workers scheme at the moment where businesses are being paid to take on construction workers. So they, they did offer some free paid, uh, sorry, free TAFE courses during the lockdown, which I did take up myself. And I think a bit more of that would definitely be beneficial. So thank you so much for your insights, being an expert from the sector. Where do you see the Australian labour market heading in the coming years? Any specific trends you expect to take shape in this market? Well, I, ho I hope it moves up the value chain, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that's what I'm hoping. Um, you know, if you, if you think about you know, our economy at a very high level, what do we do? We dig dirt out of the ground. Um, which we ship overseas in the form of iron ore, which gets uh, uh, smelted down um, to, to form steel uh, to mainly build infrastructure and apartment blocks in China. A lot of those apartment blocks don't get lived in, but they're there to just drive the drive the economy and, and drive GDP. And that's led to a uh, that combined with the trade war has led to a massive increase in the price of steel. It was up 250% until about a week or so ago, um, which did great for Australia in terms of exports. We could have done a lot better transforming that into steel ourselves, potentially uh, through some of the initiatives that, that Twiggy's talking about using uh, green energy and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, there's, there's things we could have done that better. We, we, we dig um, dead trees out of the ground uh, in the form of uh, coal, uh, which we then ship to mainly to China and to Japan to burn, to produce that steel. Uh, uh, and um, uh, sorry, to, and, and in the, Coal is obviously very dirty. It's on the nose. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, burning coal for energy. Uh, you know, the UK has had its first, I think, month now um, of uh, generating electricity without burning uh, coal since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and in some circumstances, you can you can generate electricity cheaper, um, although it's not a complete replacement uh, using renewables. Um, you know, there have been a lot of advances, but it is on the nose. And um, China has 
said publicly that it wants to match domestic demand to domestic supply for coal and it wants to stop importing uh, particularly Australian coal has been a few shots over the bow uh, with mm. one of the ports a couple of years ago um, refusing, well, saying we're going to refuse Australian coal and then turning on that. But, you know, there's obviously a, a limited lifespan to that uh, continuing the way it is. And our third biggest export is, is immigration dressed up as education, which is uh, basically the, the um, tertiary education slash, you know, business college the education or uh, English college sectors, mm. uh, which are really uh, visa factories for the most part. You know, obviously we do bring a lot of great people in and you know, over 50% of graduates in, in computer science are powered by, by foreigners and if we didn't have mm. that, we have a problem. But, but for the most part, it, it was really just for visas, uh, selling visas in a, in, a, in a dressed up way. I think now with current environment with COVID being Australia being a wonderful place where the food, air, water uh, won't kill you, uh, you can probably charge a visa for a million dollars and just say it's a million dollars and you get a visa to this country and if you have people lining up around the block to, to, to pay for it, you probably generate a, quite a lot of income uh, prior, and that could be one way to prioritize entry mm. um, uh, and then and do that in combination with a, with, a, with enhancing the global um, uh, um, talent visa, which they've now cut back by 25%. On the outside of that, uh, you know, up until up until um, you know, this COVID, you know, um, mining more generally, you um, until about 20, 2017 was having was was kind of struggling, uh, but now we've obviously got a very bright future ahead of us. But we do things in a very um, in a very primitive way. We just dig it out of the ground, ship it overseas, right? We should be, you know, many, you know, we should be transforming, you know, in, into more advanced metals. Um, we should be making composites. We should be um, making gases and chemicals um, uh, with the things that we, the energy we produce, the gas we produce, which turns to chemicals. Uh, and, and, and so on. And uh, at the moment, we, we, we just ship the raw, raw materials, which is, which is pretty poor. Um, and so, and then other than that, we, we trade over at price houses with each other and, um, and serve, each, serve each other avocado and toast, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and in terms of a service economy and, and the housing market, I think will, will turn in a big way. I mean, the only thing will keep the housing market up is if they figure out how to bring um, um, people back into the country at scale. The problem we have right now is that uh, every 106 um, people we bring in with COVID, we get a breach in hotel quarantine, and we're bringing mm. about 190 cases in every two weeks at the moment. So we're getting breach a week, and at the moment Victoria's gone into lockdown because we can't keep our hotel quarantine um, safe. The simple problem is hotel uh, quarantine should not be in the middle of the cities. It should be uh, it should be out of the dense CBD, and we should be giving the right protective equipment to the people working in quarantine, which we're not doing. We're just giving three ply masks, which don't protect the wearer. And, and keep, keeping it quite lax. And I don't think that the, the input for that has been really been thought through. But as a whole, you know, that's the economy. And I think um, we need to be producing um, more people uh, working in, in the uh, knowledge areas and more people working in the advanced trades. And uh, the only way you'll really do that is either through education or industry. Uh, industry is doing it. Uh, you know, the tech, the tech industry is growing regardless of, of the, of the relatively mediocre support that's been provided to it. Um, uh, but, and you know, you know, for example, here we train up people in all sorts of skill areas that don't get produced at university. Um, but if industry doesn't do it, um, you want to do it via education. So I think we need to make a bigger investment in education into these, um, into these um, more of the knowledge economy. And, and I don't just mean white collar jobs, I also mean blue collar jobs in terms of skills. Mm, absolutely. Um, well, they have actually had a uh advertise an incentive to get people working on the farms in Queensland and that that attracted a lot of interest and it's been interesting to see the changes that have happened in the employment sector in regards to the students and how much they're allowed to work over a span of a week that's increased significantly as well but I, well, I think well, mm. sorry just just the thing just the thing on that it's, it's, it's yeah so this is, comes to my point around um you know what are we doing in terms of in terms of the educational system and and, and the 32 billion dollar in industry pre-covid and, and bringing um tourists in i did my grad school in america and when i did my grad school in america uh you know i had to show that i could pay for my way through my master's degree while i was there and i didn't have to rely on on, on working in a job and we seem to have this strange system here in australia where we bring a bunch of people in who are you know need to rely on working in a 7-eleven or deliveroo or you know what have you to 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 fund their education so i think you know maybe we need to be um, revisiting that and taking a look at it and if the people are truly brilliant and they're very very smart and bright then maybe we should give them scholarships to stay here and help uh, improve the economy and and if they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're not at that level then maybe we should make sure they've got the money to be able to pay for themselves and not actually bring people in that can't afford to that aren't doing doing very well and are working in the right um, skill areas that 
studying in the right skill areas, but and also can't support themselves. So it's, it's kind of questions what we're actually doing with that program. Absolutely, and thank you for your insights. And I totally agree about having things manufactured locally in Australia to make us very proud to see more of that happening. Apparently in WA, there's absolutely no glass bottle manufacturing when they have such a big wine industry. So it seems um, a little bit well, behind we have no I don't think we have much in the way of glass recycling. We're shipping all the recycling off to China and then China said they're not gonna take it anymore. And now we've got a big build up of, of uh, waste. You know, so everyone goes to this trouble of separating their waste and putting it in the curbside bins and it gets picked up and put in landfill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, totally. Well, um, I'd love to chat for longer. Your insights have been so valuable for our audience today, but um, I have to wind things up. Was there any final comments you'd like to make to our esteemed audience here at Calkine? Sure. If you haven't tried Freelancer, it's free to try, try it. So just uh, any job you can think of, no, big, no matter how big or small it is, you know, uh, just have, if you've got a thing with maybe some financial research on a stock that you want to do, get someone to maybe write a report or do a financial model, just post your project. It's just type in a description of budget. It's free uh, to, to see the bids and talk to people and just try and trust me, it's you'll be, you'll be amazed. So give it a go. Okay, thank you very much for fitting us in today in your busy schedule. That was Mr. Matt Berry, everyone, the CEO of Freelancer.com. And yes, thank you for your time again. And this is Sage signing off. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.